Now switch to back to English and uh, um, without uh, any break, we're going to continue since since we're uh, over time. I'm sorry for this. Um, we continue with uh, uh, the uh, next um, uh, keynote uh, by Angela Rothan. Um, welcome to uh, uh, this conference. Uh, I'm very glad you accepted the invitation to uh, give a lecture uh, today, Angela. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, very briefly, uh, um, Angela Rotan uh, is a um, uh, professor at the University of Amsterdam um, for philosophy. Uh, her research focuses on intercultural and African philosophy, criticism of modernity, spirituality, and uh, spirit ontologies. In her work, she refers to critical theory, post-colonial theory, humanoitics, deconstructivism, and pragmatism. Angela Rotan is the founder and chair of uh, the editorial office of the philosophical magazine La Linea, um, and uh, she very recently, uh, uh, just, I don't know, a couple of uh, weeks, uh, maybe months ago, uh, she published, published uh, a book entitled Indigenous, Modern, and Postcolonial Relations to Nature. Um, you can find a flyer um, uh, of this book at our homepage, so please just have a look. Uh, this book contributes to the field of intercultural philosophy by introducing the perspective of critical and postcolonial thinkers who are focused on systematic racism, power relations, and the intersection of cultural identity and political struggle. The title of today's lecture is Where Politics and Philosophy Intersect, Deconstructive, Postcolonial, Indigenous Approaches to Nature. Welcome, Angela. It's your floor now. Thank you very much, and uh, vielen Dank für die Organisatoren for the Einladung here in this uh, conference. Thank you very much for having me in your conference. Actually, my talk will focus on some elements of this book, uh, which uh, was not published a few weeks ago, but a few uh, months ago, the paperback edition was published. The book itself is from 2019, and uh, I'm very happy that there is now a paperback, so it's more affordable. As you know, the Routledge books are sometimes very expensive. Um, so uh, for this talk, for this um, occasion, I want to focus on those elements in my um, book that concern the meta level of this discussion about the political dimension of nature. So I will not discuss what does nature mean in this tradition or that tradition, or how do different philosophers from the tradition have thought about nature? No, I will talk about how do we um, approach nature and what different types of positions are possible in this late modern or postmodern, if you wish, era. And what do they uh, bring to our political stance? And to do so, I want to. Uh, share my PowerPoint with you, and we'll speak uh, next to the PowerPoint. So it is coming here. I hope you can all see it. If not, I think the, uh, Niels would let me know. If I don't hear anything, I think I can. OK. So the title of the presentation is Where Politics and Philosophy Intersect. And the three approaches which I'll treat of are the deconstructive, the post-colonial, and the indigenous approach. And I will, of course, explain what I mean by those. Actually, uh, the focus of, of my book, or the book became, uh, got its focus when I read a report by Global Witness, which is an institution which um, keeps track of uh, environmental struggles and keeps data about them. And I was so shocked to read that um, already in 2015, and after that, the numbers only went up 
um, 100 to 200 people um, every year are killed over the struggle over the environment. So this is a, if you look at it that way, that these people all over the world in different places, in different contexts are murdered um, because of their struggle for the environment, you could say that this is the most silent war happening in our um, state. And a large portion of these um, people being killed are part of indigenous peoples. Um, in 2015, it were 40%. I don't know what it is now. So what is the aim of this talk? So uh, with this silent war, so to speak, in the background, I will look with you at the question, what do these different approaches which we can have um, over against the problem, so to speak, of um, the climate, of the environmental issues, the big global crisis of our ecology. How do these different approaches um, uh, have an effect on this? How do they reflect our stances, our actions, and how do they influence them? And you can read on the bottom of this slide that um, I do try to uh, be a as specific as possible about my concepts and to define them well. And I do so uh, explicitly in my book, but for the purpose of this talk, I cannot be too specific all the time, of course, because otherwise it would take too long. So um, let us start with the first of these three paradigmatic approaches. And I also choose with every approach uh, a thinker belonging to this uh, stance. And the first uh, is the deconstructive approach. And I choose, of course, here Derrida. And Derrida uh, can be called an animalist philosopher in my terms, this is the term which I introduced in my book. And uh, that is because he has written a famous um, uh, essay on um, the human animal divide. <clears throat> And um, in this um, essay, it is, the most important thing is that he speaks about the animal watching us. I will go into this more later in my talk, but uh, first I want to present the three positions. Of course, the human-animal divide, which is being deconstructed by Derrida, is also a symbol for, for human nature divide as such. The second one, which I call the post-colonial approach here, I choose James Murambetti as the paradigmatic uh, author, so to speak. He's not a philosopher. He's a climate expert for uh, the UN, for Africa. And he has written several um, yeah, scholarly articles about uh, conservationalism in the southern part of uh, the African continent and um, he is uh, always I'm very um, speak, impressed by his work because, because he describes all the different entanglements in the present situation very well uh, referring to historical issues legal issues cultural social economic realities and um, I would describe this as the post-colonial approach. Post-colonial is a word which can be used in many ways. And one of the ways, of course, uh, just using it as a historical um, um, term. And if we use it as a historical term, we are all in the post-colonial age, so to speak, because the time of the big colonial empires is in the past. But uh, as a way to go about things and to approach um, nature and um, to try to do something to uh, keep nature, to preserve it, etc., cetera, um, this approach is not a one dimensional approach, so to speak, not like Derrida who's deconstructing, deconstructing, 
but is trying to combine all kinds of different disciplines um, and in this muddiness tries to get some pragmatic results. The third uh, approach I call the indigenous approach and for this approach I chose uh, Davi Kopanawa as um, the paradigmatic speaker and Davi Kopanawa is a Yanomami shaman and spokesperson and the spokesperson I mean that yeah, Davi uh, Kopanawa also um, has um, uh, evolved into being someone going to, for instance, United Nations or other places where he can speak for the rights uh, and the position of his people, but also of other indigenous tribes or peoples in the Amazon uh, area. And uh, he has written a, a thick book, which I've used also in my book, um, Written is not the exact word, it's written with the help of uh, Bruce Albert, an uh, anthropologist who has built a friendship with him and also became a kind of mediator and um, loyal to the cause of uh, the Yanomami people. And he has held these uh, interviews over the years with him on his request and turn them into this uh, book, The Falling Sky, called Words of the Yanomami Shaman. And the English version came out in 2013. So these are the three positions. And um, for the indigenous approach, I would say I would choose the words of um, Copenhagen, who says, leaving the forest is a danger to humans. And um, of course, the forest can be taken as a, a symbolic indication. For him, it's a real forest, but for other indigenous peoples, it may be the savanna or the, the tundra or other natural locations. Okay, let's uh, say some more about the deconstructive approach. Um, Derrida, in his um, essay, another essay than the one on the animal, in the essay White Mythology, which is already from, I think, 1971, he um, talks about philosophy as, um, wait a minute, I have to do something to my screen to read the text. He says something about the um, philosophy, and he means the philosophy seen as the, in, in which the Western philosophy, so to speak, uh, sees itself as the philosophy per se, and uh, has built itself on this um, creation myth where it started with the ancient Greeks and progressed until it reached its peak in the Enlightenment and beyond in Western Europe. So um, here's a, a quote, philosophy is a process of metaphorization which gets carried away in and of itself. So this is for him, the white mythology. The white mythology is the uh, forgetting that all your thought is based on metaphors and thinking that it reveals truth in itself, objective truth or absolute truth. So. This, um, as Derrida indicates in the article, gives a legitimation of Europe and of whiteness, although he doesn't use that term, but it is clear from the uh, essay. And also a legitimation of the human point of view as absolute. These three things, the human, the anthropocentric, the Eurocentric, and the white-centric, so to speak, are going hand in hand. So to um, deconstruct these, we have to become aware that the animal, and here we see the, a, a very beautiful statue of a cat, which is in the par park where I often take my walks, um, that the animal is looking at us. So in this Eurocentric vision, we only uh, see the world before us, and we never realize that we are also seen. And um, 
I chose a cat not by coincidence because Derrida himself also had a special relationship with the cat. So this becoming aware of our position is the start of certain human modesty and becoming aware of other voices, other uh, viewpoints, etc. Not just those from animals, but those from all others who are not me. So he also writes in this essay, The Animal That Therefore I Am, that uh, the human animal divide doesn't define two clearly separated domains, but indicates a multiple and heterogeneous border beyond which a multiplicity of organizations of relations between living and dead can be um, distinguished. So what we mentioned to be a human is constantly shifting, so to speak, and also what we call non-human. Well, now, Moore and Betsy, in my book, I, um, I use his work to critique also a story which was very famous for some time in the news, the Lawrence Anthony story. Lawrence Anthony was a, a white conservationist in South Africa who had um, acquired a large, uh, very large um, a spot of land and in the case of his life had um, invited or taken their herd of elephants which was under threat of being killed because they were too close to um, they were not um, um, they were not being able to keep them in their um, original reserve they were always breaking out etc and threatening human um, lands so um, after Lawrence Anthony died, he, um, the elephants who were on this large land started, actually, actually before he died, they started to walk. And when he had just died, they arrived at his house and kind of mourned for several days around it before disappearing in it. So there was a book about him um, called The Elephant Whisperer. And when I read it, it's of course a fascinating story. This man who had special relationship with elephants, but also it's again, this kind of hero story of the white man single-handedly saving nature. And the, the uh, local peoples, uh, the, the, the natives, so to speak, they are um, uh, only secondary characters in this story, they are either helpers of him, the good uh, natives, or they are um, people who want to kill uh, animals on his land, the bad ones. Um, now, Moore and Betsy makes all this muddiness a bit more concrete when he um, studies how these um, how it is possible that only such a white man can do such an act of conservation because um Warren Betsy shows that um, there are different laws since the um, apartheid days in South Africa um, or different countries in Southern Africa the dual land tenure system he calls it and they have created different uh, legal possibilities of ownership for um, uh, modern firms, modern farming um, enterprises, which are mostly white, and those of the communal um, um, groups who have a communal possession. And this, of course, was sold as um, adapting to the African indigenous peoples, their way of life and their communal um, structure, but this is now in the present day a very strange, um, has a very strange effect where um, the choices being made in issues such as conservation are much more limited for people from these um, black um, communities than for the, the whites or others who have modern enterprises. 
Now then uh, let us go to Davi Kopenawa. And here I have quoted extensively because I think that many people of you may not know his work. And of course, his voice is the voice most uh, unheard of in philosophy. Um, let me just read this quote, and um, I think you will understand most of the non-Western words, uh, but I will um, give a brief uh, synonym synonyms for them. What the white people call nature is Urihi'a, the forest land but also its image, which can only be seen by the shaman, the spirit of the forest. It is thanks to this image that the trees are alive. For us, the hapiri are the true owners of nature. So hapiri is a word which is used for something which we would call spirit, but it's different than a uh, spirit in the Western tradition, because the hapiri can also be talked about in very, um, um, imaginative ways like dancing, bear, bearing feathers, etc. And uh, in some of the languages of the Yanomami peoples, hapiri may also mean the shamans themselves. Second quote, what white people refer to as environment is what remains of the forest and land that were hurt by their machines. I would prefer them to talk about nature as a whole thing. So to my students, I say this book by Davy Coponara is a philosophy book because it criticizes concepts and um, places these concepts in critical uh, theoretical approaches. So when he talks about uh, white language, he uh, says nature is a, a such a good word and ecology is a good word because there are holistic words, but environment is a word he uses for the situation where we already see nature as separate from us, as something uh, out there and not as something which we are part of as human beings and what we are responsible for. So when we um, not listen to the Khapiri. The Khapiri are friendly to the forest because it belongs to them and makes them happy. The white people, they find nature beautiful without knowing why. On the contrary, we know that what they call nature is the forest as well as the Khapiri that live in it. Omama created their houses and paths there. Omama is the great creator. He wanted us to protect them. If the white people ravage the forest and destroy its hills and mountains, the Hapiri will lose their homes. Furious, they will flee far away from our land, and human beings will remain there at the mercy of all ill. This is the danger of leaving the forest. Now, what knowledge are we talking here about, and by whom? Since the beginning of time, Omama has been the center of what the white people call college. It's true. Long before these words existed among them, and they started to speak about them so much, they were already in us, though we did not name them in the same way. For the shamans, there have always been words that came from the spirit to defend the forest. If we had books like they do, the white people would see how old these words are. So this is also a very interesting quote. This quote also challenges the idea that philosophy, thinking critically about our reality uh, or the reality of which we are part or of which we have to become a part or whatever, um, that this thinking about it, this philosophical or theoretical activity uh, is not, um, only the activity that is done in written words. So oral cultures can be philosophical as well. Here, Copenhagen also challenges a very common prejudice. Now, let us come to a recapitulation. I try to make my lecture not too long. We are already running out in the program, but I also think it's nice to keep some time for discussion because I'm very curious about 
how you think about these issues too. Um, so what are the issues and how to go about them? The deconstructive approach by Derrida is concerned with a specific intersection of philosophy and politics. That was the title of my talk, where politics and philosophy intersect. Derrida is um, concerned with the politics of work. And you could see his approach as one which is kind of within the white culture, although he's not completely part of white culture, uh, have, having been born in Algeria, in an Arabic culture, as a Jew, uh, etc. So, um, but by going to France, studying there, building a career there, and later in the United States, he has become part of the um, white philosophers, so to speak. Uh, the Western philosophers, maybe I should say that better. Maybe he's not a white philosopher. But he tries to change things from the inside. He's a not destructing philosophy as Western philosophy, but deconstructing it, showing the cracks, showing where it is weak, where it is not consistent, where it is ideological, and leaves these things in the open or whatever may happen with it. So it is this dismantling of the white mythology. The post-colonial approach uh, by Mumbetsi is uh, concerned with the politics of structures and institutions. So he is very pragmatic, realist. We have these laws, we have these economical systems where we are dependent on, etc. We are in a globalized world. So He's not ideological in a detached way, but trying to be realist and trying to repair things in such a way that life for the um, original peoples who live um, in the land, or also the immigrants, for everybody, so to speak, can become better and um, that we find more just ways to deal with uh, nature and what is left of it. And the third, um, approach, the one by Kopitawa, is concerned with, and that is a term which I give to it, of course I give it also with the other approaches, I would call it politics of epistemology. Uh, it is about who has the right to speak, who has the right to say that their knowledge is knowledge, is true knowledge, is valid knowledge. Of course we are all epistemologists since the Enlightenment and since, um, I mean, now we not human beings, but we as part of this type of conference, of this type of um, Europe-based uh, Europe discourse, we are all followers of, of Kant in a sense, who decided that it was important to decide what is valid knowledge and what is not valid knowledge. And as you may know, Kant was not only the writer of the three critiques, but also of the little um, essay where he, um, the Träume eines Geisterseers, or Dreams of a Spirit Seer, where he denounces um, spiritual knowledge as, well, not interesting for a scholar, not interesting for people who seek valid knowledge. So this is uh, important to know that in the same time that this uh, system of epistemologically based um, belief in science and in uh, scholarly knowledge was built, at the same time spirit knowledge and spirit ontologies were uh, banned from the European discourse. Now let's um, Look, take a final look, so to speak, on these um, intersections between um, politics and philosophy. And um, of course, words change. When we speak about nature, when we speak about ecology, etc., words are not always um, meaning the same thing. They are changing um, according to where we are, in what time we are, and um, they adapt themselves to different realities. So this is something which I ho hope to have drawn uh, attention to, 
that we're always in a situated story. We are not able to do timeless philosophy or uh, say things about the world which are um, valid for always or for everybody. The second thing which is, I think, important um, in my uh, presentation of these three approaches is to realize that history is not a fate that decides our actions and meaning but that our destiny is in our hands, so to speak. We have to be the makers of our own faith. And here I um, borrow a, a sentence of Karl Popper in his Open Society book. So it's, we can only inform ourselves very well. We cannot base our um, actions on universal knowledge or something like that, but um, we, will always have to make um, op optimalized choices, but we cannot know whether they are the best. Now, the question who talks is, I think, the important one to ask in a conference as this. In the end, it is about whose voices we are ready to listen to. Do we listen only to white voices? And by white, I, I do don't only mean or don't mean the skin color because the skin color of so-called white people is rather pinkish and not white, but whiteness um, of course um, refers to a certain culture which does um, give privilege to people of lighter skin. But uh, mainly whiteness or white culture or white philosophy indicate a certain modernist uh, relation to nature and to ourselves. Do we only listen to those voices or do we also listen to the voices of those who struggle with the post-colonial heritage? Or do we also listen to the voices of those who prefer to remain in the forest as Copenhagen said about the people? And if we open our ears to them, can we maybe also listen to the voices of those who are on the other side of the multiplicity of difference between ways to be living and ways to be dead? That is, of course, a reference to the Arida's um, deconstruction of the human animal divide. So are we also able to listen to the voices of animals, of plants, of rivers, etc.? So. This was what I wanted to say to you, and I ho hope to have incited also some discussion. Here is my list of references. I think that's important to give to you. And uh, this is my final slide. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to be joined now to the discussion again. <laughs>